We're speaking with Michael Chug, Australian entrepreneur, band manager, artist manager and uh, tour promoter. Welcome to the Australian Music Vault, Michael Chug. Thank you, Brian. Good to it's have you here. It's lovely to be here. Absolutely. Now, I want to get on in a moment to the first concert you ever presented, but firstly, just for my interest, the first Australian band you ever saw. Um, there were two in a matter of four weeks and they changed. That was it. The first one was at the Albert Hall and Launceston supporting Screaming Lord Such and that was Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs and they nailed me to the wall and that was just unbelievable. Obviously, you know, we were hearing music on the radio and everything but that was it. And then three weeks later another tour came through and the, the band that I played for all the acts in the first half opened up the second half and that was even more incredible and that was Max Merritt and the Meteors. So those two who obviously ended up becoming lifetime friends, that was where it all began. And what was it about the sound or was it the environment? What really did nail you to it the It was the energy, the freshness. I mean, it was, you know, it was the Beatles that were come, had come and, but the live energy of those two bands was unbelievable. And it maintained through the rest of their careers and um, the bridge between them and the audiences. Those two guys were unique in that. Yes. So, yeah. All right, tell us about the first concert you promoted in Launceston. Um, I'd run the concert previously. Um, I was uh, I was in, in Tasmania, you played AFL football or you rode bicycles. And I was riding, I was racing bicycles um, in the Launceston Amma Cycling Club and uh, um, I was actually at 15, I was an arsehole loud mouth artist rep on the committee and the old people didn't like me very much. Who were you re representing? All the riders. Sorry, I said artists. I yes. should have said cyclists. <laughs> um, and uh, they were having a big fundraising thing and I was uh, working at Young's Furniture Shop and I was working in the soft furnishings department with a guy called Rodney de Klerk who was the bass player of uh, Launceston's biggest band called The Dominoes. He later went on to play with The Mixtures. Uh -huh. Anyway, I said to him, can your band play at a dance? So he said yes and I found another little band called The Chevrons who I went on to manage and we ran a dance at the Launceston Trades Hall. My father's fireman mates were the bouncers and we raised 80 pounds for the cycling club. And how many people were there? About 400. Oh. Yeah, it was successful. And I thought, gee, this is really interesting. And uh, I was also uh, doing announcing. I used to do the track announcing at the cycling. I was calling the gallops and the trots and the greyhounds. Uh, as a track announcer as well, I was like 15, 16 at the time. And then I started running local dances around Launceston. And I used to go down when Big Axe came to a big dance called the Luau at the Albert, uh, the, not the Albert Hall, St Albies, it was the Catholic Church Hall. I'd go down and I'd watch the International Axe and I'd watch people like Ron Blackmore and, you know, I just was very, very interested in the whole scene. I couldn't sing or play for shit, so <laughs> I figured promoting and managing was the way to go. So this is Tasmania around about 60... 64, 65. And how many international acts were coming down? Well, um, there wasn't a lot coming down. Uh, I think Blackmore brought one or two down, but mainly they were the Bobby and Lorries, the Flies, the yep. Lynn Randells. MPD. MPD, uh, later on the Easy Beats. The Twilights, the Groove, and I, I started. You know, the, those bands had flying. They played Devonport Thursday, Launceston Friday, and Hobart Saturday. And I would walk to Devonport to see the show there. Then I'd walk home to Launceston, usually on the Saturday morning, go straight to the shop where I was working at the time, and then that afternoon I'd walk hitchhike to Hobart. 
So I did all that and eventually Tasmania got too big for me, too small for me. Too small. And I'd done one or two trips to Melbourne and uh, eventually I decided to move to Melbourne. What was the scene like? What do you remember of the scene in Melbourne when you first arrived? Well, you know, it was... Um, there was a big agency called AMBO which had been set up by Ron Blackmore and people who, like Gary Spry who managed uh, the Flies and Ronnie Burns and um, Bill Joseph, the local dance promoter, and uh, Ron Blackmore. And, and they were basically booking all the acts. Anyway, I moved into Melbourne and I went into AMBO one day and uh, to say hi to Ron Blackmore and a few people who I'd got to know over the time and there was a young guy sitting down the back quietly working away, red hair, big nose and I went down and we started talking and it was Michael Gadinsky. And um, he was working for Bill Joseph running dances and everything. He just started managing a band from Western Australia called The Chain. Yes. And um, we got to know each other and he used to run down in Balaclava, East St Kilda in broken down old mansions, he'd run this thing called the Magic Mushroom. And they'd move in illegally into these mansions, run a big dance, and the police would usually shut it down after one or two Saturdays. I used to help him with that. I started putting up posters. I had a Tasmanian band called Ida May Mac with me at the time. Uh, Tony Naylor went on to be one of the top session players yes. with Bootleg and Olivia Newton John. Another story. Anyway, one day Gadinsky said to me, Michael Browning and I are starting an agency called Consolidated Rock. And they had Billy Thorpe, Doug Parkinson, The Chain. They were getting James Taylor move, this incredible band Healing Force. Yes. So they had a whole collection of what I suppose alongside what was happening then was like the new wave of Australian rock. And uh, Gadinsky got the chain on 3UZ, which was a huge breakthrough mm. to get radio. Thorpe had moved down from Sydney, grown his hair long and was learning how to play guitar yep. properly. So they opened up using the lobby at Sebastian's nightclub at the top of... Uh, of Exhibition Street and it was, you know, just a small little lobby really and they'd sit there with the phones and the little desk and I was working down the road at a soft furnishings warehouse and I used to walk in Carlton and I'd walk down and buy them lunch every day. So when they finally moved, we moved to an old house at St Kilda Junction, which isn't there anymore. It's where the roundabouts and everything is now. And we moved there and I got the job as the poster boy, um, which was great, and um, got into music full time and I had Ida May Mac and it was very, very happening. Yes. I mean, it was, you know, the suburb, Daddy Cool had blown up big. You had yep. the TF Much Ballroom in Fitzroy, Captain Matt's Vox Whoopie Band. Um, there was an agency called Let It Be that had them and Spectrum and then you had Consolidated Rock and, of course, Thorpey was getting ready with his new album and because I'd known Billy and ran into him over the years, he, um, he, I actually was lucky enough to get, much to Gadinsky's disgust, called into the marketing meetings to help plan more arts than class and all that. And so... I then started taking, because of my experience in Tasmania, I started taking Thorpey, The Chain, Healing Force, Doug Parkinson and bands like that, and I'd tour them through Tasmania. So all that started then. And yeah. Yeah. Tell was, us, just let's go back a little bit. When you first met Michael Gadinsky, yeah. paint us a picture. What sort of guy was he? Well, he was young and he loved the music and he loved, you know, he loved the music. He loved putting on shows and, yeah. you know, because of the Bill Joseph involvement, they were running dances, you know, in uh, down on uh, towards Mornington and all over the place really. And what were the mushroom shows like? Well, the Magic Mushroom Mansions, you know, that all ended and went away but, you know, when... when uh, the Sunbury Festival started and everything, that's when the whole mushroom thing started to evolve. 
and then, of course, his label. Yeah. Mushroom Records. That's right. Now, you were involved with how many Sunbury festivals? Well, <laughs> there's a gap between there. They, one of the big things that they were doing was they were running regular Sunday night town hall shows and they'd bring Tully and Tamam Shad and the Lady Dars and they had Daddy Cool and Spectrum and Billy Thorpe and the chain and they would run these amazing Sunday night shows at Melbourne Town Hall which would sell out in a minute. I eventually um, became stage manager and um, um, the first night I stage managed the Lady Dars were coming down from Sydney and the travel and the rain and everything was horrendous and they arrived late and I had to tell them that they had to fuck off, they couldn't play. Right. <laughs> that went down. Well, I ended up managing them after that. But <laughs> uh, then all that was going on, we had bands like Healing Force that had that huge number one hit, Golden Miles, Thorpe's Most People I Know Think I'm Crazy. I mean, the, it was really the happening yes. place. So Michael Browning decided we would open an agency in Sydney. So Browning and I went to Sydney to run Sunday night at the Sydney Town Hall. You moved there? With the aim that I would move there and run the Sydney agency with a local Sydney agent, young agent. So we went up to Sydney. We had Sydney Town Hall which was a horrendous day because there'd never been any rock and roll at Sydney Town Hall. The, the guys running the joint, the guards and the, were like Nazis right. in hell. And we couldn't do shit. They were all over us all day. It was horrible. So anyway, we had Lobby Lloyd, we had Freshwater, Jeff St John, the Lardy Dars, Billy, Spectrum and Jerry Humphreys was the... Oh. The compare. Right. So Billy had done a show two weeks before at the Melbourne Town Hall where Pig played the organ and Rodney Curry, this mad designer, had built this huge inflatable sculpture. Right. And there are there is footage and everything around of all this. So the Melbourne Town Hall, it was horrendous because as the sculpture blew up, it started to push all the equipment off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so we, anyway, that's another story. So we got to Sydney, we've got the sculpture, we've got Billy and Lobby and, and so you've got a situation where in those days the PAs were a couple of columns mm. each side of the stage and a little amp, that was it. So Thorpe and Lobby hooked everybody's sound systems together. So you had a monstrous sound system. Yeah. So Lobby goes on, he's the first act on. And I'd, he'd never admit to it. But as he came off stage, he, he messed with the PA and it never worked properly again all night. On purpose? Well, he'd never admit to it, but I think he did, yeah. To, to perhaps... Stir it all up. Stir it up. Because whilst they were all friends and mates and buddies, there was plenty of rivalry. Competition. There. So, and Lobby had overplayed. I'm down the front of the stage going, come off, Lobby, please, yes. please, you... We won't get into that. And the crowd's into it. Oh, they were loving it. Big it was, crowd. Yeah, it was sold out and Johnny O'Keefe turns up and proceeds to sit in the balcony right above the stage in a white suit and Billy gets the shits big time. Really? He, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So Johnny he, O'Keefe not playing? No, he just turned up to be the king and sat above the stage and royal, royaled it over everybody. Wow. And Billy had the shits big time. So there's delays with bands going on because the PA wouldn't work right and it comes down, we've got a curfew of 11 o'clock. At 20 to 11 we're trying to get Billy on stage and it's just a nightmare. <laughs> Nothing's working properly and Jerry Humphreys is flipping out and Nazis Because he's run out of material. Yeah, and the Nazis telling me that he's going to blow it all off at 11. So finally we get Billy on and... Halfway through the fourth song, the Nazi blows the power off and, you know, the crowd boo and hiss and throw a few chairs around and be the last time we ever play Sydney Town Hall and all that stuff. Billy's so angry that, of course, the sculptors got half up and started to knock stuff over again, of course, and Johnny O'Keefe's sitting up there and, oh, it's it. just, it was, 
that wasn't a good vibe backstage. No. So anyway, to really nail it all, in those days, Go Set was unlike any magazine today. Rolling Stone, you can name any magazine. Go Set was huge all over Australia. Classic was, music magazine. It was the bible of Australian music. Like when I was still living in Tasmania, every Friday you'd go and buy it. Mm. And it, it meant a lot. It was a mm. big part of the Australian music scene. Anyway, on the Wednesday of the following week, out comes the headline, Rock Con at Sydney Town Hall. Uh. Molly Meldrum. Well, he denies it to this day that he wrote it, but he did. Anyway, Browning gets the shits and decides he's going to start a newspaper. So it's a slamming review oh, of that show. Rock Con at Sydney Town. Hall. And Con as in a, a rip-off yeah. but also consolidated. consolidated rock, Rock Con. Yeah, so Molly wrote this article and Browning got really angry and decided to start a newspaper called The Daily Planet, which was a, a hippie... Style music paper. Yeah. Did you ever see it? Yeah, I remember it. Right. Had some good writers. Dr. Oh, it Pepper. had some great writers, but the editors were usually tour manager roadies who were totally off their face on yeah. marijuana. Yeah, yeah. Who were the so, main writers? Oh, you there remember? was. Well, Leah Dillow was a big writer for a while. Driver, who was the chains roadie. Dr. Pepper, maybe. Yeah, Pepper David was Pepperell. It. Yeah, he was there. There were a lot of different freelance writers. Anyway, I'm in Sydney running an office and in Sydney at the time the local scene was dead. There'd been a couple of agents that had just buried Sydney. There were hardly any gigs. When you brought a band up from Sydney you struggled to get a week of work whereas if you came to Melbourne you'd be working three days a week, uh, three shows a day. This is late 60s. Uh, late, well, early 70s. Early late, 70s. late 60s, early yep. 70s. Anyway, I was up there running Consolidated Rock Sydney. Browning sent a reporter up who was living in the house my wife and new wife and I were living. There was no money coming in because the Daily Planet was a disaster and it was draining all the money from the touring and the agency. Yeah. So Consolidated Rock went bankrupt and Michael joined Ray Evans at the Entertainment Exchange who had been one of our opposition. And uh, I was in Sydney with no money. I was managing the Lady Dars. We had a few bands, Tam Shad, Piranha, Jeff St John, Company Kane. Yes. And um, so Roger Davies, who was a roadie with Company Kane, and I started an agency called Sunrise, Out of the Ashes and all that yeah. shit. <laughs> and we became, Ganinsky and I became rivals for quite a while. So when the first summary came along, um, they booked a few of my bands yes. but we weren't really involved as such. Right. But you were in subsequent years? Sort of. More? I'd just walk on and say what I wanted to say. No one was going to stop me. Right. So you were comparing or...? Not really. I'd just get up and introduce my own bands. I had country radio at the time. Greg Quill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Piranha. We had a big lineup the first year. And, of course, Billy was my mate and Max Merritt, of course. Because they all dropped acid. <laughs> Every muso yes. at the first summary was on acid. Yeah. And I was not really into... Um, anything at the stage. I might have started to have the odd joint. Yeah. Anyway, a couple of radio friends of mine turned up and uh, um, a drummer that we won't mention turned up from South Africa with these little bullets in brown paper called Durban Poison. Right. So the night Thorpey goes on, I have a joint with these friends about half an hour before Billy goes on of this Durban Poison. Hashish. No, grass. Grass. And they were just little bullets, not even as big as that. Yeah. Anyway, I got so stoned <laughs> and totally paranoid and when Thorpey comes on with 300 amps on stage and 
you know, you've got the lattice wire fence behind you and you've got all the red and all the smoke and the follow spots and all these people yelling out, suck more piss. And that I got so paranoid, halfway through the second song, I grabbed my wife, we jumped in the car and raced back to the farm where I was staying and hid under the blankets for a couple of hours. No, yeah. you missed it. I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> It's always struck me as slightly odd that Billy Thorpe, I mean, it's sort of, the, you know, that whole suck more piss thing, it was almost feeding into the Australian yobbo drinking mentality, whereas he was more, he had that acid-dropping hippie. Do you see what yeah. I mean? Do yeah, you? yeah, no, that was definitely all part of it, yeah. But I mean, the whole beginning of... of the pub scene was incredible. Yeah. You know, every Thursday night he'd play the White House Hotel in Nunna Wadding and they'd line up for... Yeah. You know, but then in those days in Melbourne the scene was incredible, you know. On a Saturday you could you do um, Village Green Hotel out near Monash on yeah. a, in the afternoon then he'd start at either Birdie's or Sebastian's or the yeah. Thump and Tum and... Then you'd end up at Frankston or Dan in on at one of the big dances. So yeah. you'd do three shows in one day. And that wasn't happening in Sydney? No, no. Sydney was gone. We used to battle. You know, Thorpe would come up, you know, and we'd do Whale Beach and uh, we'd go out and do the Roxy at Parramatta and then there was the Whiskey and the Chevron in the city and pretty much all the big dance, suburban dances had disappeared. I mean... We tried. We started to run our own dances yeah. uh, in Eastwood and Randwick and places like that because there used to be a lot of schools, South Sydney Boys High and all these schools that used to take bands, but it had all gone away because these agents had just abused it. Maryland. So you think it's, it was because of the agents? Oh, yeah, it had all disappeared and there was, you know, Tam and Shud would run their own shows up at Whale Beach and Mona Vale and... So slowly we we created it again, yes. created it and built it up. But yeah, it was mm. it was like chalk and cheese. Are you starting to manage bands? I'm just looking at my notes for a second. Here. I was oh. managing the Lardy Dars. Right. At this point. Yeah. And Greg Quill and Country Radio. Right. And how did you enjoy that? Oh, I loved it. Loved it, you know, loved, you know, setting up shows all over Australia and Adelaide and, you know, I remember once with Ida May Mac we got our big break at bus stop in Newcastle and I bought a, an old blue Ford ute off Warren Morgan, Pig Morgan, and he'd put a big canopy on the back so he could fit the gear in. And I bought it off him. I think I gave him $200. It could have been pounds. And I owed him some. So we went off to Newcastle and the, the van blew up at <laughs> Albury. Right. And we hired a taxi with a trailer to get us to Newcastle. What was the fare? Oh, it, was, it wasn't cheap, about 400 I bet. Just about ate all the money we were making out of the gig. So I was out walking around Newcastle one Sunday, on the Sunday afternoon and... Uh, this DJ from the radio pulls up and says, you're chuggy. I said, yeah. He said, they're trying to get you on the radio. You need to ring Launceston. So I rang up. My younger brother, he was eight years younger than me, uh, was a champion swimmer. And uh, he was about to go to South Africa as part of the Australian surf team. He was uh, he was junior Ironman champion. And he was on his way to Lowhead Beach, which is 40 miles from Launceston, to do uh, the life-saving duty for the day. And he went out the back of a mini miner through the back window and he wasn't expected to live and he was in a coma in Launceston mm -hmm. Hospital. So, uh, so I got the mail train from Newcastle to Sydney, which took like six hours, mm. and then flew to Launceston. So it was one hell of a weekend, our yeah. big trip to Newcastle. And he, he recovered, of course, oh, and was, he was in the coma for 12 weeks. But it was just unbelievable that we were going off to Newcastle. And I bet. 
So that was just part of what yes. being on the road was, yeah. really. Yeah. So what, were, what sort of shows were Kevin Borich doing at that point? Kevin was in the Lardy Dars. <laughs> right. So, he, sorry, it we was were, the Lardy Dars. Yeah, I was managing Lardy Dars. And they were, they were a very big band. I mean, we used to have a policy. We're playing all the festivals and all those big town hall shows that we'd never close. We'd go on second last and then Billy Thorpe or Daddy Cool could try and come over the top because the Lardy Dars were one of the great live bands. Yes. And um, they were still together. We'd released a couple of albums, Rock and Roll Sandwich um, and stuff, and they, it was moving along. So nicely. whose idea was it to adopt that principle of n never closing? Oh, I was just... It was Phil Key who went on to... Left the Lady Dars and formed Band, Band of, Light. of Light. It was him and I. Him and I used to run the band pretty much. So the idea was that you would make it so hard. Yeah, I mean, we'd headline at, you know, dances yeah. and stuff. But, but, but you made it when hard. When it came to the 200,000 people at the My Music Bowl or, uh, you know, Mulwala Festival or town hall shows, you'd never follow Billy. Never follow the Lardy Dars? No, the Lardy Dars would never follow Billy. I wouldn't allow it because no one followed Billy. So we'd go on before him and make it harder for him. <laughs> Daddy cool and bands at the time. So, so um, Let It Be decided to sell and, then the, and Daddy Cool's accountant, Philip Jacobson, yep. uh, came to Roger Davies and I who were in Sydney and asked if we wanted to buy Let It Be and start a national agency, which is what I'd always wanted to do and it was against Gadinsky at Australian Entertainment Exchange. So we bought Let It Be and it became Sunrise Let It Be. And, of course, after we bought it all, we find out Daddy Cool will never work again and <laughs> we bought an agency without the headliner. Yeah. And Spectrum turned into Mertzeps. That was good. And we had uh, the Little River Band was making big waves then. And so it was pretty strong. At, uh, but it started to get really tough and then Roger decided... He picked up Sherbet and, of course, everybody in the industry said Ro Roger had lost his mind and Sherbet would never make it. Why? Because of the... Because they were pop. And the satin pants. Yeah, they the weren't... Velvet. They weren't the grunge chain or Thorpey or yeah. uh, the la -di -da. So, but, of course, they went on to be huge. I mean, yeah. I, I can remember ten Perth entertainment centres and... Real for my music. Oh yeah, it was incredible what Roger did to that band. He'd come back from America with two albums a few years in before. One was the Rod Stewart, the classic Rod Stewart and the Faces album, and the other one was the Doobie Brothers. And they basically moulded Sherbet ah. around all that. On that. So style. Roger wanted to go off to America. Uh, with Sher and try and break Sherbet, how's that? And all that stuff was happening. So the Sunrise Let It Be thing, it was not really working. And I was sitting in the office in Sydney one day and it was 70, 72, 73 and this old roadie who used to look after me and drive me around and work in the office came up the stairs and said, George Young and Harry Vander are downstairs. And, of course, I was a huge Easy Beats fan. Yeah. I was so excited. I was like a little boy. So I went down and sat down with them and they said, we've been told that you're a really good cat and that you're honest and you look after people. Uh, we've just made an album called Hard Road with Stevie Wright and we'd like you to be the manager. Okay, great, fantastic. And they played me Evie and all that and, of course, through their relationships with Rod Muir who pretty much ran radio in those days. Evie got on air and yeah. before we know it, we've got this monstrous number one record that went for weeks and weeks and weeks, an album that was blowing up. And uh, I put together the all-star band, which in those days was George and Harry, Kevin Boric, Johnny Dick, Ronnie Peel, who became Rockwell T. James. Yeah. Um, Mark and Kennedy was no, on no, drums. Mark, no, Johnny, no, Johnny, Johnny Dick, Dick was Dick. on drums. 
And we started doing shows and Stevie was playing Festival Hall and all those big hordens and it was monstrous and um, I couldn't work out why he'd go on to screaming hysteria and walk off to virtual silence. And it took me a long time to work it out. And uh, I accident I worked it out by accident one day when we were doing a show at the Mind Music Bowl. And um, Stevie and the conga player, who used to be with Tam Shud, were upstairs. And I went and ran into the hotel, kicked the door in and said, come on, you pricks, we're running late. And they were over in the corner with a piece of alfoil and a straw and I thought they were doing hash oil. So I said, give me that fucking thing, get in the van. And I did it. Two hours later I'm laying on the ground at the Maya Music Bowl throwing up. It was heroin. It was heroin and no one knew. So I should have known because for months living in McMahon's Point in Sydney and Stevie was living at Whale Beach, he used to stop on every second Friday night or so and so I need 30 bucks to buy groceries for the wife and kid. And it was to score, I had no idea because I was pretty naive. Mm. So we didn't tell anybody. We kept it under wraps. We got him on methadone. And then Alberts had scored this amazing deal with Mercury Records in England and Atlantic in America. So Stevie and I went off to England and, you know, the Easy Beats had been pretty big and mm. they'd had hits in both America and England. So we were there. We were, it was monstrous promotion. Mm. The record companies, Chris Gilby was running Alberts at the time, English guy. And um, Mercury were throwing fortune into it. Atlantic were running double page ads in Billboard and had this massive promo tour set up in America. Um, I stayed in London one day to do all the planning for the ongoing promotion and sent him to Manchester to do some promo. I caught a train up later that day and I arrived, walked into the suite we were in and I knew straight away he'd scored. Mm. So I immediately destroyed this antique hotel room around him. <laughs> Rather than kill him, I killed the room. <laughs> right. Cost Mercury a fortune. Anyway, it all settled down. I had to come back. At the time I was working as a freelance tour director for Paul Dainty. Anyway, I come back for Rory Gallagher. Yep. And he goes on to America to do all the PR and, you know, TVs and... Stevie Wright. Yeah, 20 cities, all that stuff. Anyway, I'm in Adelaide. I've been back about four days. I'm in Adelaide and... My old roadie mate, Ray Arnold, who I mentioned earlier, but not by name, who was actually the one that discovered the Easy Beats at the immigrant hostel. Wow. Anyway, he rang me. He said, oh, just saw Stevie. I said, no, you didn't. He's in Chicago. He said, I'm telling you, I just saw Stevie going into Desi's house in Randwick. Mm -hmm. Desi was the heroin dealer, this evil woman that we all wanted to kill. Anyway, Stevie had jumped on a plane in Chicago and come home and that was the end of it. Atlantic dropped the record, da 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 it was all yeah. done. Sad, and, terribly yeah. sad. If we had have kept him straight, yeah. he could have, that album could have been number one worldwide. Yeah. So that was a huge disappointment for me. Of course. Now, um, Michael, where do you link back in with... Michael Gadinsky. Well, um, the whole Stevie Wright thing is, you know, I was getting the blame. Ted Albert, George and Harry, everybody said I'd screwed it all up. Oh. So one night we were down in the studio. He was recording Black Eyed Bruiser and he was doing the vocals and I walked into the control room, George and Harry there. They were very icy and as I walked past the booth, I saw that he was strawing silver paper doing heroin while he was doing the vocals. So I said, well, I've had enough of this, come with me. And I took them round to the window and they saw what was going on. So finally everybody worked out that I wasn't fucking up, he was. No. And, and uh, it was all very depressing and disappointing. I'd basically closed Sunrise, Roger had gone off. I was managing Kevin Boric, we'd just 
done a record deal. Uh, and we were having a lot of success. Chris Murphy was running Solo Premier, it was called at the time. He was an agent. He told me that somebody needed to manage Richard Clapton, who was difficult, terrified of getting on stage. Um, <laughs> so I was managing Kevin and Richard and um, just basically doing all that and out of the blue, Gudinski rang me and said, listen, how would you and Philip Jacobson like to join Premier Artists? So um, I said, yeah, that sounds great because we were always, you know, whilst we were rivals, we were still pals, friends and uh, so we, I said, yeah, so I flew to Melbourne and we had meetings and Philip and I became directors of Premier Artists. So I'd, I'd actually started a company called Marquee Attractions with a guy called Stephen White. Right. Who managed Dragon for many years and now manages Lee Koenig and people like that. So we were doing that and so I had Marquee Attractions. I was freelancing with Dainty doing... Uh, status Quo, Rory Gallagher, Robin Trower, Wishbone Ash, Fairport Convention Tours. And um, so I joined Premier Artists as a director. About 70, maybe it was 79 or 80, we started the Harbour Agency, so it became Premier Harbour. So we had an office in Sydney, office in Melbourne, because I was living in Sydney. And um, that was pretty successful at the same time, you know, I was... Kevin was doing well. I took Richard and Kevin to America in 77 and tried to break. It was very funny. I mean, we were your real parochial Australians. So you're living in America with Richard Clapton and Kevin Borich. What year is this? 76, 77. And how's it going? It was going okay. Unfortunately, they made the mistake of buying a pound of Colombian grass and... Everybody was too stoned to do anything. But I was moving backwards and forwards because at that stage, Dainty, had, we had this amazing run of big tours. Started with ABBA, David Bowie, uh, Linda Ronstadt, Fleetwood Max Rock Arena. Yes. Which um, Kevin and Little River and Santana were on. So I was going backwards and forwards and Dainty used to pay me a fortune. So... I'd make a lot of money and then go back and use that to keep them in America. Um, and it was going okay and Premier Artist was doing all right. And we did Rock Arena and um, so that I was making a lot of money out of dating and obviously I was learning stuff. Yes, touring international artists. Yeah, and, and like with ABBA it was the first time we'd had a proper roof come out from England you had hydraulics in the stage. You were touring with a, you know, an outfit that was like when they first got off the plane in Sydney. It was like it looked like the Swedish soccer team. They were there. so everything was so together. So you met people and you saw the latest yes. production. I mean, no longer um, were we, you know, we were becoming more and more part of the world. And this yep. is a long time before, you know, the way it is now. So um, things are rolling along and in 78 I was in London with Kevin Boric. He was recording an album there for Gadinsky. And um, he said to me one night, I'm going to the Lyceum, come with me. So we went down to the Lyceum and saw this three-piece band called The Police <laughs> who'd blown my head off. They were just unbelievable. And I'd had... A couple of years before that when we were there, I'd seen this, these posters all around town with a clown face on them and I came back to Dany and I said, there's this guy in London wears clown makeup and he's got this huge hit called The Show Must Go On. We, we should look at touring this guy. So I went to Festival Records and talked to them about Leo Sayer and we came up with this amazing campaign, how to break Leo Sayer in Australia, which we did. We ended up, we, we brought him out for 20 shows and he ended up doing 40. And that's when I was with Dainty. Anyway, I, 
I really liked what was going on. Now, he was before what we see when we go to the live scene. And all around London there's ads for uh, the specials and Reckless Eric and Elvis Costello and... Graham Parker. It was all starting. Yeah. So I came back to uh, to Australia and I said to Dainty, we really need to start because I would do tours, JV tours by this time with him. Anything I had found we'd do together. Came back and I said, we've got to start touring this English stuff. And so the legend goes, him being a up-class British gentleman that wanted to be Sir Paul Dainty and his biggest ambition was to meet the Pope, he said, I'm not touring that East End scum. So the next four days later we're sitting in Dundas Lane, Mushroom House, having a premier artist meeting. And I said to Gadinsky, I think we need to start a touring company. And Gadinsky says, yeah, I've been thinking about that. And he reaches down, he's got this big old brown briefcase and he pulls out of the briefcase the publishing contracts for the police, for Squeeze, for Reckless Eric, for Graham Parker, for Elvis Costello, virtually for the whole Stiff Records. What, he'd already organised He No, he'd signed the publishing deals. Great. So we spoke to a friend of ours, Ian Copeland, who was one of the three Copeland brothers. Yep. Miles Stewart, who was the drummer in the police, and um, Ian, and he was the agent. And he'd gone from England and opened an office in New York called FBI and they were bringing all the English music into America. And we we uh, we did a, Michael did a situation with him where we were able to call ourselves the Frontier Touring Company. And we started the Frontier Touring Company and um, did Squeeze and the Police, the first two tours, and the way we went. And yeah. I was on, I was actually touring Fleetwood Mac with Dainty, it was the second Fleetwood Mac tour. And John Courage, their tour director, was winding Dainty up something shocking, you know. How does it feel your tour director's running the biggest tour in Australia right now? So at the end of the tour in Crosshurst, I was sitting across the restaurant and Dainty was sitting over there and he threw a bottle of red wine at me, <laughs> which missed by a couple <laughs> of inches. And that was the end of that and we started Frontier. And who were the big act? When you look back at your time with Frontier, who were the really memorable acts that you toured? Oh, well, the police were certainly that because we started off in, you know, as theatres and ended up in stadiums and mm. they were wonderful, wonderful people. And so, you know, we had, we were touring Madness, a lot of English yep. stuff initially. And then in 85, 86, we did the first ever... Neil Young tour of Australia, which was monstrous. And then we did Bob Dylan and Tom Petty. So by then we were really starting to get mainstream. And so obviously that was a big, big step up for us. And then in the early 90s we had Madonna, which was at that stage was four Melbourne cricket grounds. Mm. And Guns N' Roses, which still hold the record for the biggest one day crowd ever. Eastern Creek. So we'd build it up. I mean, on that Madonna tour, the audience was like that to 70. Yeah. Gadinsky and I used to spend most of the beginning of the show going up into the back and grabbing the family with the two year old and putting them in the back row of the platinum area. Right. The platinum people didn't think much of it. <laughs> but about 900 little kids got to see Madonna probably. Yeah. Anyway, we did all that and it was really successful. Michael used to, he'd be doing all the overseas and I'd put it all together here. So you're a good working couple. Oh, we were good. We were nobody better. I mean, we're promoters. We don't put tickets on sale and if they don't sell, we'll give up. And did you have relationships with the artist, oh, so yeah. when Dylan is touring or Madonna well, or Guns I still, and Roses. Well, I still tour Dylan today. 
Yes. So, you know, so what's that? That's 86, 2017. Yeah. So next year when he comes back, it'll be about my 12th tour. So, yeah, and, you know, when when we finally split, some acts went with Michael, some acts went with uh, me. And why did you split? Um, oh, there was stuff going on within our agencies and that where, you know, there was a guy ripping bands off and stealing money and no one was really dealing with it and I didn't like it and uh, I really wanted to get into the internet. I was having trouble with my old mate Philip Jacobson at the time I bought out this band I fell in love with. They had one hit single and the two had lost 40 grand and it was like... Who was that? Radiohead. Right. Oh. I still do them now. I lost 40 grand and he was, we shouldn't be touring these little bands and it's like, Philip, our little bands become big bands. Yes. And, and they weren't interested in the internet at all. Really? Michael Gadinsky wasn't? Was not interested. Why? He felt it was... Well, this is 98. It was very early days. Yeah. But I, I could see something was going on there. And uh, then, so I decided to start my own touring company. During this time, you're managing quite a few bands possibly, but I want to talk about three of them. Jimmy and the Boys, the Sunny Boys and the Church. Yeah. Early 80s, um, Chris Gilby again at Alberts came to me and said, I want you to manage this band. He said, they're difficult, but they've, they've got this song which Robert Hilburn, the LA Times writer, described as the best pop single in the last two decades called Unguarded Moment. So I met the band and they were, you know. Difficult. Well, they knew better than everybody, right? So we started, it was a great band. I mean, the sounds, those guitar sounds and everything they got was yeah. so unique. So, so we go off to America to Capitol Records and this sums up how they were. And um, Capital are very excited about the single. We walk into the publicity department in LA and the three girls running the marketing PR department, all they wanted to talk about was how wonderful the Little River Band was. And you're there with the church. And the church, like the Little River Band <laughs> to the church are the greatest horrible... Yeah. So... About an hour later we walk out, the band said, we're not doing this, and we walked out of Capitol Records. Oh. And are you trying to persuade them? Yeah, and th these women were just digging us further and further into the fucking hole, you know. <laughs> so I sat with the A&R guy who's a friend these days, a guy called Bruce Raven, and he'd given me shits cause, shit because I was five minutes late for the meeting. And it all just went to shit. So we decided we probably had more chance in England. So we moved to England. We're living in a downstairs apartment on Ladbroke Grove in this building that was owned by one of the Arab sheiks. And we befriended the caretaker and whenever the Arab sheik would go home, we'd move up into his penthouse. <laughs> Anyway, they were working okay and they had a following and everything. And uh, we got offered the Duran Duran tour and we, I, I convinced them we needed to do this tour because it would put them in front of a hell of a lot of people. Yeah. So I came back and met with the guy that was one of Murdoch's guys by then running. They'd bought ATV Northern Songs. He was the publisher. I convinced him to give me all this money to do the Duran Duran tour of England. And the band, you know, they really weren't into it. Anyway, we go to Glasgow, they play the first show and they really killed it. Except, of course, you got a lot of little girls screaming out, we want Duran Duran. Yeah. So we do two shows and then Kilby says, nah, get fucked, we're not doing the rest <laughs> of the tour. So the agent quickly booked some European dates and they went off to do that. But a few recently, I'm not sure if it was Steve or one of the others, they said to me, 
We really fucked that, didn't we? So, and what, where were you with them when they did Under the Milky Way? Eight weeks before, no, it's probably three months before, I had done a deal with a, a LA guy to buy the management contract off me because I just, well, it, it was a combination of stuff, but I decided I, I'd had enough and... Uh, so of the church? I was, well, I was getting out of management full stop and we'll get into the other two acts in a sec. But um, So I'd sold the management off, never got paid, of course, as you do. And um, about four months later they had Milky Way tonight. Mm. At the same time as we were living in London, I moved the Sunny Boys over there. And they were really, really starting to get a buzz going. They were playing the marquee, they were playing all these places and there was a real vibe. Mushroom Records were operating there at the time. It all felt really, really good and then Jeremy got sick. Mm. So they'd had their hits in Australia, yeah. Happy Man, Alone With yeah, You. Yeah, and we'd done really well here. I got involved with them because... Um, Lobby Lloyd was managing and producing them. That's right. And they were deeply in debt and it just wasn't going anywhere and I can't remember who asked me. It might have been one of Gadinsky's people asked me if I'd get involved. So for a while I co-managed them with Lobby and we got them all back on the straight and narrow. And um, the album with all the sunflowers on the yes. cover. That's the one we took to England. And the vibe was building. They they just killed it. The reviews at the Marquee Club, we'd been offered residencies, we were getting offered tours and then Jeremy got really, really sick and that was the end of that. That was it. Yeah. And what about Jimmy and the boys? Jimmy and the boys, well, wow. <laughs> you pick the easy ones, don't you? Oh, that was incredible. That was just ridiculous. I went to see him at the Civic. One night they were rehearsing at the Civic Hotel in the Cross and I walked in and they're possibly the worst band I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> they were terrible. But they were really good in what they were trying to do. Exciting to yeah. watch. So I got involved and I really worked on, you know, getting the band really tight and... They became a very, very good band and, of course, you laid Joylene and and Iggy on top of that and mm. for a while there we were just, it was crazy and we were selling out all over Australia and I'd dress up as the doctor and go on, cut up bits of meat and I'll never forget the night at the Capitol Theatre in, in Sydney when Iggy slashed his arm and cut his artery and we had to race him to hospital. By mistake? Yeah. Yeah. Totally by mistake. Yeah. So what, you're dressed as a doctor? Oh, yeah, there's photos of me dressed up as a doctor on stage cutting him up. And <laughs> I'll never forget one night we were playing in Hobart and we were staying in this um, this hotel up in the West Hobart Hills and Ignatius and Joyland had been down to the fish markets that day and bought all this seafood, whole fish, lobsters, crabs, and after the show, we'd gone back to the hotel and proceeded to get totally drunk and stoned yeah. while they cooked up all this seafood. It cost $2,000 to get that room cleaned and the owner told me three years later you could still smell it. <laughs> so, you know, that was very exciting. We made a record, not like everybody else. The band were incredible. It was tough going because you had two gay guys and, a, you know, a, hetero, a very bullish rhythm section. Mm. But it was really happening. That's That record, everybody else, was great. Um, then the rhythm section left and we built another rhythm section but it was never the same. Mm. We recorded our Teddy Bear's Picnic and we a uh, Tim Finn song. Yeah. They won't let their girlfriend get next to me or something. Yeah. They won't let my girlfriend, I can't remember. Anyway, it went gold. We had a number one record. The album was okay. 
but that was people had lost. The vibe. Yeah. Yeah. So, Michael, the next uh, important point in your career, the forming of Michael Chug Entertainment. Tell us about that. Well, that was 99, 2000. And we just decided, you know, I wanted to do it. And we had clients, obviously, that had come with us from Frontier. Was Michael upset, by the way, Gadinsky, that you'd left? Um, you know, look, we we used to have the most amazing arguments. It was a bit of a joke in front of all the big acts like Billy Joel and people like that when Michael and Philip and I would have these massive fights, which never really, you know, they were just half the time I think we just put them on to stir everybody up. Play fights. And, um, you know, over the years I'd sort of, I'd had enough of this, I'm leaving, and I'd never really left. But this time I was just determined to do it. And what I did was I flew around the world and I went and saw uh, a very good friend, top line agent in LA, then got straight on plane and went and saw two big managers in New York. And then gone straight on the plane and went to London and saw four people there. And then flew back to Sydney. I'd been gone 36 hours. And then I flew down to Melbourne and resigned that afternoon. No one knew, no one in my office, no one knew. And I flew down and resigned and he sort of, you know, I've heard all this before. <laughs> and um, a couple of days later he flew up to Sydney and we sat down and I said, no, I'm not coming back. It's done. I can't do this. I said, you want me to come back? You get rid of that guy who's stealing all the money and I'll think about it and he wouldn't. So I left. And deep down he was quite proud of me for having the balls to do it. So, you know, so that was that. But Michael Chug Entertainment has been incredibly successful. Yeah, it was, yeah, we had a rocky start. It was Did quite, you? Yeah, well, I had two biggest bands in the world at the time, the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Santana, and the dollar dropped 50 cents. So on my first two monstrous tours, I was the only promoter on those two acts anywhere in the world to lose money because when I'd booked them, the dollar was like 85 cents. Yeah. And when they toured, it was 50, so. But that wasn't my fault. But that was shaky times. Was it? Yeah. So what turned the corner? Oh, it just kept going and the dollar went back up. Yeah. You know. And then um, in the late 90s when I was at Frontier, we'd done this tour with a band called Blur and uh, we were out in the harbour and the agent was sitting on the back of the boat with me and he said, oh, I've got this solo star that's about to happen and I can't tell you who it is. I worked out who it was. I said to him, what, the little fat bloke from Take That? He laughed. And along came Robbie Williams. And that, you know, that was incredible. And still is incredible. I mean, you know, the first tour we did, he was monstrous in New Zealand. He'd had five, six, seven, eight hits there. We went over there and we played to 140,000 people. Wow. Yet here, he hadn't been getting any airplay. Mm. He'd sold hardly any records. He'd had no hits. So what was going on at the time was Nova were about to start. And I went to Dean Buchanan and said, I have a tour that could really help Nova explode onto the market. Nova Radio. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Rob Logan was running Today FM network at the time and he found out nobody was playing the record right he found out and he sent me a message through EMI telling me that if I uh, if I gave the tour to Nova he would never ever play Robbie Williams again and I sent a message back to him saying put it in writing <laughs> so I can put it on the front page of every newspaper in the country anyway Nova launches with Robbie Williams. We end up selling out Perth, one and a half Sydney's, one and a half Melbourne's, sell out Brisbane, sell out Adelaide and 
three years later and comes back and plays half a million people. Incredible. Yeah. And, and why, do you, I mean, apart from some of that timing, what is it about Robbie Williams? He's the great, one of the greatest entertainers I've ever seen in my life. So, you know, that's been a very, very big part of everything. Yeah. But so is Bob Dylan. Yep. If you bring him back too early, it's not that good. If you wait a bit longer, we all people forget our, forget things and you sell <laughs> out again. Um, Radiohead have obviously been a big part of this. Um, Pearl Jam, when we did that stadium tour, that, you know, Pearl Jam had been coming in and out of Australia with another promoter and, you know, they'd come in, they'd sell out and no one would know they're here. So when I... I was asked to do a tour. I, I said no initially because I didn't want to cut the other promoter. And uh, they said, no, no, he's not getting it. So I looked at it and thought, you know, they've been coming in under the radar for many years. So I, I got Ben Harper to play on it and we did stadiums. Susan Heyman, who's my managing director, looked at me as though I was totally mental and crazy. And we ended up selling out stadiums all over Australia and New Zealand. It was unbelievable. And these acts are, uh, are loyal to you. They don't, like his Michael... I've lost one act in the last 15 years, Cold, was... Coldplay, who I'd done, started off in clubs and went up through the hoard and into arenas and stadiums. But Live Nation, um, who are horrible paying all these acts far too much money. They, there was a situation where Coldplay wanted to do the Live Nation World deal but they wanted to keep me involved in Australia and uh, Live Nation in the end said no to it if you stay with Chug. So right. that's the only act I've lost. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it sort of helps. Gadinsky and I, our main keeping us alive right now is wiping out Live Nation. And wiping out the evil corporate and all this, all this ticketing, scalping that's going on. And yeah. So we've got a lot of reasons to stay alive and try and make it. Yeah. It's so unfair to what's happening with the fans right now with all this scalping stuff. Mm. And, you know. But we're we're winning the fight. Good. All right. Just quickly, a couple of key moments in your life. So we're backtracking slightly. A long way to the top. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. In a situation at the Siebel Townhouse with Clinton Walker and Clarkey, um, they rang me and they said we, we were going to do a one-hour series for the ABC. Paul Clark. Paul Clark. Yep. Sorry. And they rang me and said, we want you and Billy to be the first interviews. Oh, okay. So we go down to the Seawell Townhouse and Billy goes in and starts talking and all of a sudden they're hearing about these bands they've never heard of and all this stuff they've never heard of. And then, of course, I come in and it just gets worse and they're just lost. They don't know what to do. <laughs> all of a sudden they've learned all about the Australian music industry. And they knew nothing and we'd been there, we were there for 16 hours. So anyway, they decided they'd make it into a bigger series. I was overseas for a couple of months. So, you know, they went off to make the show. I was overseas for a couple of months. I got off the plane in Sydney and I walked up to the customs guy and gave him my passport and he said, gee, you were fantastic last night on Billy Killed the Fish. I thought, what the fuck's he talking about? So over the next 48 hours, I get all these people telling me about this Billy Killed the Fish and, and I find out that they've turned into a six-part series and it's the biggest rating television show in the history of the ABC. So Thorpey starts on me. Come on, we've got to take it on the road. Let's take it on the road, build a big show. We'll get all the acts. And I'm going, oh, no, I don't want to fucking know about it. No <laughs> one will come. And so, yeah, and Amanda Pillman was involved. Yes. And, and so we've come up with a list of the acts and Amanda's out talking them all into it and I'm sitting there thinking this could fucking be the end of Chug. <laughs> <laughs> so we go on sale and it goes berserk. 
We end up selling nine Sydney entertainment centres and nine, eight Melbourne tennis centres. And who are the acts? Oh, Cole Joy, Judy Stone, Lucky Star, Lonnie Lee, Dinah Lee, uh, Cole Joy, Kevin, and Ke- you know the Joy Boys. Yep. Uh, Ray Columbus, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs, Stevie Wright. And that was an incredible story. Uh, Max Merritt, John Paul Young, Normie Rowe. Oh, another couple of girls. Um, the Cookies, Marcy. Marcy, the Marcy Cookies. Marcy Jones. Um, Bev Harrell, maybe. No, or? no, no, not Bev Harrell, not Lynn Randell. Molly, Molly made our lives misery because we didn't put Lynn Randell on. Right. Russell Morris, Spectrum. Wow. Tamam Shud. Ronnie Burns. No. John used, Farnham. No, we used Ronnie a few times to sub for people. So all of those acts in one show. Yeah. So they're all doing one song. Some did one, some did yeah. two, some did three. And Thorpey, of course, closed the first half with the 60s and then closed the last half with the 70s. And, you know, Billy was determined to get Stevie Wright on. Stevie was living in Canberra in a wheelchair, very ill. Stevie, Billy went down and brought him up, got him in the studio and it was really cool to see Stevie go on every night and then the whole cast would come out and sit around him and help him sing and it was amazing. So what did he do, Evie? Evie. Any Easy Beat songs? No. No. Was there any involvement from George or Harry? No. No. But he did it. Stevie did it. He got up and he sang. Yeah. yeah. Very emotional. Yeah. Oh, look, the whole thing was just unbelievable. And then, you know, we're sitting at the Hilton Hotel in Melbourne for two weeks doing those nine shows. And every night they'd end up in the bar with the grand piano and you'd have Kevin Jacobson and Normie Rowe and Russell Morris and Ray Columbus and Thorpe and everybody, Cole and everybody singing till 6 o'clock in oh. the morning. They used to take up... The, the bar staff got so exhausted that they refused to have to open the bar on the last night. <laughs> so the, all the players went around and raised $2,000 and gave the bar staff two grand to open it up. Wow. Yeah. And what were the other emotional moments during those shows? Thorpey, presumably, doing Most People I Know. Um, oh, look. Stevie. There was so much emotion. Russell Morris doing The Real Thing. And Wings of an Eagle. And yeah. Lucky Star doing it. I've Been Everywhere, Always Raised the Roof. Really? Judy Stone, uh, Dinah Lee. And Cole Joy. He and- opened the show. And he and Kevin were all right at this point? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a long time before all that shit. Yeah. And what would he open with? Aha. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ha, ha. <laughs> Be my baby or whatever. Yeah. And that was the perfect opening. You know? Yes. We had to talk him into it, but when he realised... And was there an MC? Did you MC? No. Um, or did it just all flow? Just all flowed. And we had, uh, we had a revolving stage. Yep. Very much we had disco dances um, and, and, you know, you, all those famous logos of the 60s and 70s, the bullseye and the flyers. And yeah. So each set would change. Amanda did all that. It was incredible. And was Molly involved? No. We had trouble one night in Melbourne. He was totally paralytic and he came on during Russell Morris. <laughs> oh, during the real thing? Yeah, I had to throw him off stage. <laughs> That was oh. incredible. I'll never forget. Yeah. I was sitting um, in the very last row of the Sydney Entertainment Centre one night, just sitting there. Anyway, they opened the doors and all these people come in and I watch this old guy and he's struggling with help coming up the stairs and there's a couple of people helping him and he comes it's halfway up and he comes all the way up to the last row where I'm sitting. He looks at me, recognising me, goes, no wonder you fucking called it a long way to the top. <laughs> Classic. 
That was a very special time. Yeah. When Billy died, it was probably the worst couple of weeks of my life. Yeah. Because it was unexpected. Totally unexpected. He's fit as a fiddle. And he just finished a record called Tangier, which was an incredible piece of work that he actually won a posthumous yeah. aria for. But We just finished a gig down at near San Remo. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was totally unexpected. Yeah. Um, all right, what about, uh, what do we go to? All right, Chug Music. Chug Music. Um, I decided to get out of management in the 80s because I wanted to get married to my second wife and I wanted to focus on Frontier. About 2012, I got a couple of phone calls. One was from Brian Brown telling me about these two young kids called the Lineback Brothers from the Northern Beaches. Their band's called Lime Cordio. And I got another call from Baruch Atal, who was the percussionist in Yothi Indy. And I'd done a lot of work with Yothi Indy in the 90s. Um, yep. We toured them here in Frontier and then I helped set up all their world stuff and went to the Atlanta Paralympics with them and everything. So I was very close to them. He rang me up and he said, listen, there's these three kids who were born in Papua New Guinea and I taught them how to play and sing and you got to hear them. And I, for six months I'm saying to both Brian and Baruka, no, I'm not interested. I totally don't want to know about management or anything like that. Anyway, eventually I... Lime Cordial were doing the back room at the Tivoli in Sydney. And I went down there one Saturday night and it was totally jammed with 300 of the best looking young teenage women you've ever seen in your <laughs> life all wetting their pants and going berserk. So I went, shit, that's interesting. Anyway, Baruch is still hassling me and uh, um, he said, look, their dad will fly them down. They're now living in Brisbane because they're going to high school and a couple of them, you know, they're too old to be living in Papua New Guinea. So I finally I said, okay, fly them down. And I put them in the back room of my office. So the kids walked in and they're all nervous and sweaty and they've never really played live before. And Jay, the guitar player who writes the songs, was with them and put them in the back room, they opened their mouths and started singing and that was it. Unbelievable. Yeah. And they were called Shepherd. And um, their father had been trying to get them happening and they'd played a hard rock band competition here in Sydney and one of the judges told them they'd never make it and they were hopeless. And They'd made an EP called Let Me Down Easy Oh, not called Let Me Down Easy, but it had the song Let Me Down Easy on it. And uh, then I find out the old man's booked a show for the Australian Consul in the summer stage in Central Park. And I said, what are they paying the airfares? And he said, no, no, they're paying us 200 bucks. And I've gone, <laughs> well, fuck. So I thought about it and realised it was in August and uh, I've got some friends who run a huge festival in Janesburg called Oppie Copy. So I rang him up and I said, I need a favour, I need you to put Shepherd on, which they did. And then I rang a friend of mine in London who at the time was running Love Box and quite a few festivals and one of them was Wilderness. Mm. I said, I need you to put Shepherd on Wilderness, you know, maybe a main stage and a couple of little stage shows. He said yes. And then the following weekend would be the uh, summer stage. So I have a very good friend in LA called Sat Bisler who runs a company called a and Worldwide. He has a radio show called Passport Approved. He's on nearly all the big FM stations in America every Sunday night. I rang him up and I said, I need you to help me put Shepard on at the Viper Room. He said, OK. So we did a world tour. Nothing was happening here or anything. We did this world tour, which Dad paid for. And, of course, you know, I know how to do things properly without blowing lots of money. So we did that. We're in L.A. 
and um, Sat loves the band. And he says, oh, I want to do an interview and put on my radio show. Mm. And we said, okay. So he did the interview. He put Let Me Down Easy on the radio show. And the English program manager in Oregon, one of the top stations there who'd broken Monsters of Men and Mumford and Sons, hears the song and puts it on mainstream radio where it promptly blows up and becomes the most requested song in Portland, Oregon for ten weeks. So Jay Bavino's brother is a top cameraman at Channel 9. He just actually won an award this year. He gave the EP to David Campbell. Campbell listened to it and went, shit, these songs are fantastic. Mm. He Googles up the band and sees what's going on in Portland, Cleveland, San Diego, and he hassles that program manager at uh, Nova called Paul Jackson for eight weeks to play Let Me Down Easy. (laughs) And so finally the band fly down to play David's morning show. That afternoon Jackson adds the single to we sign a deal with Decca in London. By this time we've done three world tours on Dad's Money playing to record companies and their fantastic acoustic in the boardrooms, the two girls and Jones and George. We'd signed a deal with Decca and by this time they've written Geronimo. And away we go. Yeah. And Geronimo was massive. It still is and it's driving us crazy because it won't go away. Really? Yeah, it's a bit, I, it's a bit like Gautier. I feel a bit sorry for Wally. You know, you, you have these monstrous songs. Yes. And it becomes very hard after that. To, but we're doing know. okay. They've just, they toured England with Little Mix doing stadiums. They're about oh, to great. tour, tour um, America in November. The singles are doing okay here. Yeah. There's a lot of problems at the moment with um, music and how it relates to charts and yeah. ha- how many streams make a, a chart position. Yeah. So there's a lot of Australian music at the moment not getting its mm. just dues in this country. Mm. I mean, we, Shepherd have done 600 million streams on Spotify worldwide. It's still doing 2 million a week. Wow. And now it's across the other songs. But yeah. To actually, you know, and there's been a lot of, a lot of talk, not just about us, but about a lot of bands mm. that aren't getting chart positions here because they haven't, they haven't worked out how to divide the yeah. streams into all yeah. sorts of that. And yeah. of course, downloads are non-existent. A whole so other thing. It's just incredible how it's. Yeah, uh, Michael. What about the great roadies of the Australian music industry? Yeah, God bless them. There's millions of them that. I've, well, you know, I started off as a roadie. Mm. In those days you used to do everything. Um, one of the first, well, you know, there was Norm Sweeney, God bless his soul, who was with Billy Thorpe and when I was first to him, uh, roading in Melbourne, he he befriended me and helped me load gear in and out when we were doing shows with Thorpey. There was another guy called Wayne Swampy Jarvis who no longer with us. Who stay, he was with the Lodidars and then when we started Frontier, he was one of our main tour production guys for many years. He was an amazing character. Kevin Borich told me a story just a couple of weeks ago that he wrote, going to see my baby tonight, as a joke, serenading Swampy That's in the right. back of a bus. That's right. We used to drive up and down. They had a stretch uh, transit van with... Air, airline seats, and we would drive up and down you know, Highway to Sydney, and Melbourne, with and just uh, the van was a continual cloud of hash. <laughs> Swampy was very special, and uh, I met this guy in Melbourne who befriended me and became one of my best friends. He was working with Daddy Cool at the time, a guy called Scrooge Madigan. Yep, and um, Scrooge used to have. I mean, if any of his friends were in trouble, he'd be right in there saving their ass. The funny story with him was uh, there was a couple, actually. We did the first um, 
Gary Glitter Tour for a mad Jewish stonehead called David Gingas from Sydney. And we were playing the Melbourne Festival Hall and there's about 600 people there. And Scrooge and I were sitting on the side of the stage smoking a house joint. And we didn't know who the fuck Gary Glitter was. And all of a sudden the lights went out and on stage on this motorbike comes Gary Glitter. It was the most incredible show <laughs> that these 600 people and Drew's and I had ever seen in our lives. It was amazing. So we get to Sydney and we're doing a free concert for 2SM at Moore Park and there's no, in those days, there's no security fences or yep. backstage. There was a caravan backstage for Gary. Anyway, he comes on and it goes berserk. And comes off stage, he's in the caravan and all the little girls run round and the caravan gets tipped over and the door's facing up and Scrooge is on top of the caravan trying to get Gary out and Gary's in the caravan going, Scrooge, Scrooge, don't touch my hair! Because <laughs> obviously it was... Anyway, not... Wanting to get into the Gary Glitter thing, he's no. a bad man. But we brought him back. He was unknown. We brought him back nine months later. Yeah. In July, and we called it Gary Glitter is July, and we printed all these big posters with the calendar, with him smashing through the calendar. Right. We did five Melbourne Horden uh, festival, festival halls, halls, five Sydney Hordens, three Brisbane. Outdoors in Perth was unbelievable. Wow. Wow. Yeah. But that was Scrooge. Scrooge is, you know, it's just there's so many great roadies around and um, they've started their own association. Yeah, which is a great thing. And And Lloydie, what about? um, I spoke to Lloydie on the phone yesterday. Actually, he he sounds really, really happy and he's got the big grey. He looks like a fuzzy wuzzy. (laughs) The roadies are great and we, um, I was involved. Quite a few years ago now, was setting up Support Act Limited. Yes. Which um, was done with Michael McMahon and Jim White and a few other people because none of the industry have, you know, medical. Or... So we started Support Act and with people like Lindy Morris and, and the case officer. So it was really, really pleasing for me to see about three years ago that the Roadies Association and Support Act Limited got yeah. together. Because they work and they lift and really it's tough on their bodies and yeah. they don't get the adulation. They don't get the no. applause. No. So it's, you know, the roadies are the heart and soul of the business. And, yeah. You know, people often say to me, why do you stop and talk to all those people? And it's like, listen, it's like the gatekeepers. Or yeah. This. Or the, the old guy that sweeps up the dressing rooms. It's all part of the show, you of know. Course. I'll never forget, you know, one of, I was in um, a Day on the Green in Oakland, California at the first ever ACDC concert when they played. Uh, it was Ted Nugent, Blue Oyster Cult, all these acts. Yep. And I was sitting backstage with a very famous um, American tour guy called Patrick Stansfield. And I said, Duh. Who's the little Mexican over there picking up all the shit and he's in little short shorts and a holy purple T-shirt and sweeping up and everything? I said, and every time bands come in, they all kiss him and cuddle him. And Patrick said, that's Bill Graham. Oh, really? Yeah, and that the was, what, 70, 70, 75? Yeah. And he was one of the biggest promoters in the world. So... You know, I felt quite proud when he said that because that's how I am. Yeah. If I'm walking around backstage and there's empty cans, I'll pick them up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's so I have respect for everybody and it doesn't hurt to give people the time of day. Absolutely. Especially when the shit goes down, they're there for you. Michael, you've won a number of awards, Father of the Year, Order of Australia, Promoter of the Year. Is there one that really stands out as as meaning something very special to you? Well, I mean, obviously, the Order of Australia means something because it, you know, I don't talk much about it, but I've been involved in big charities, and as you know, we've run those the Wave Aid, Wave Aid, and the Sound, Bushfire Sound one. Relief, and the Bushfire One, and 
live earth and all that, but I, I'm proud of that. But I get a big kick out of the fact that I've won the Pole Star Award four times and Ganinski's never won it. <laughs> He asked me last year if I could, if I'd withdraw my nomination. I said I don't nominate myself. You're right, you're right. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. You love it, don't you? Yes, we do. And do you love it as much as you ever did? Oh yeah, probably more. Why is that? It's like watching Elton John in Hobart during the week. And watching this guy that is enjoying it more than he ever enjoyed it, who's singing better than he ever sang, and he's playing like unbelievable, and talking to him and, you know, the happiness that he's able to do that. And it's the same for me. So, you know, it's like when Shepard played Rock and Rio um, and went on before Sam Smith and Rihanna on the main stage on a Saturday night. Who could ever imagine that? And to watch the crowd who've only really heard Let Me Down Easy and Geronimo singing every song. Yeah. And you stand on the side of the stage and, you know, the, the uplift you get. I mean, the communication and watching Robbie Williams, you know, and how they can take audiences and mm. that just keeps you young. It's not about the money. I worked that out. When I was a kid, it's not about the money. If you do something successful, the money comes. I mean, my, and I say this to a lot of young acts and a lot of young promoters, if you believe in something, just keep banging the head on the wall, baby, the wall will fall down. Yeah. And lastly, Michael, are you able to identify, <coughs> are you able to identify anything that is distinctive about Australian music? It's just got so much energy, you know, and like, you know, for many years it was pub rock and it was all in that vein, but now you've got all these different types of music genres, you know, like you've got your Bliss and Echoes, you've got your Presets, you've got Vance Joy, you've got Courtney Barnett, you've got, there's so many different styles of Australian music, but they've all got that boom. And they've all worked really, really hard to, to, to you know, the, the, like now Australian music is regarded worldwide as, as a real thing. There's no doubt about it and you can see that by the, the, how many bands are working overseas. I mean, I, you know, we go on shore with Tour with Shepherd and we're doing the festival season and you run into 100 bands. Mm. You run into Australian bands you've never heard of. And it's all about the energy, it really is, and the enthusiasm. And I think back, you know, you look at now and you think back to Skyhooks, Cold Chisel, The Angels, all those bands, they all had a tickle but no one, if it was today, fuck. If we had had the internet, Crowded House wouldn't have nearly just made it, they would have made it. Yeah. And that's... And, you know, it's all good songs. Yeah, great songs yeah. and energy. And maybe some people speak about a sort of um, a knockabout spirit or a larrikin. Yeah, no, well, that's that's right. That's all part of the energy, the larrikinism and the, the, you know, the ability to overcome bullshit. And yeah. We're very good at that. <laughs> and so are you. 